Hi! Welcome to our lectures on bioinformatics of sequencing. Today we're starting with three really important concepts that I want to make sure everyone gets. We're going to be talking about the, the way that we determine whether a sequencing base call is correct or not. We're going to talk about how we do mapping, which is a really key approach for um, aligning the sequences received from the sequencer to the known annotation. And we're going to talk about assembly, a process by which we stitch together a bunch of small reads into longer contigs and scaffolds eventually. So those three concepts are all going to be covered in the space of one lecture, so hang on for the ride. It's a long one. We're going to start with a little introduction to, this, to sequencing chemistry. Now, if you find that you're squinting at the, uh, the picture on video, I strongly suggest you download the PDF for the slides directly from the description that appears below this on YouTube. It'll save you a lot of time, because I know reading this on off-camera is tough. So we're going to start with sequencing chemistry to understand, for example, how Sanger sequencing, or dye terminator sequencing, differs from contemporary sequencing uh, in a massively parallel or next-gen sequencers. From there, we're going to talk about the FRED algorithm. Now, the FRED algorithm has been with us since the mid-1990s, but it's still incorporated. The, the way that it expresses base calling error probabilities is still used in today's sequencers, so it's important that we understand how it works. From there, we'll talk about our choice of why we might go the mapping route rather than the assembly route, especially in well-known genomes. From there, we're going to talk about the Burroughs-Wheeler algorithm, uh, the, the aligner uh, that came from it. It's a concept that I think can be a little difficult for, for new people to bioinformatics to get, um, but I, I think that it's important to take a walk through that and understand it a little better. Um, from there, we're going to talk about the value of k graphs, um, specifically for developing something called a Wehlerian path. When you have a bunch of reads, but you don't know the sequence, uh, the, the full length sequence to which they belong, you need to do assembly to get at that. k graphs are one of the most common ways that we do that. And along the way, we're going to be talking about some file formats of some importance. FASTQ, SAM or BAM, and FASTA. So all of those are going to come in the course of one lecture. Um, I think many people took biochemistry uh, at an earlier stage in their careers, but they may have forgotten some pieces of it. So I'd like to uh, return us to that mindset for just a moment. We start with a polarity associated with DNA. That DNA is built from the five prime to the three prime direction. We have a backbone that alternates phosphates and sugars, in this case, a deoxyribose, um, and we build in the direction of three primes. So there's this hydroxyl hanging out here off of this sugar, and that hydroxyl is the point at which we can attach a new nucleotide. If this OH is missing, we cannot uh, extend in that direction. So this, this OH has a really big role to play. We also have nitrogen bases that connect off of these sugars, of course, and those are the A, C, G, and T that we spend so much time talking about. So this three prime hydroxyl is going to come into play in this very next slide. In old sequencing, in Sanger sequencing, we were frequently using something called dye terminator sequencing. Uh, for this, we're going to have a mix where, we're, where in, uh, in vitro, uh, in, the, in the test tube in this case, we are going to be uh, expanding a, uh, a, a piece of DNA to reflect complementarity with a template sequence. So we have a template sequence, and now we're going to build complementary um, uh, base pairs to that, basically. So you could imagine that when we add our first nucleotide, we add a, di a dideoxy uh, nucleotide. A dideoxy nucleotide does not have an OH on it. So as soon as we add this labeled T, uh, this dideoxy T, uh, to complement this last letter of the, the template sequence, we can't extend any further. The, the fact that it lacks this hydroxyl means we can't build any further. Now you can imagine a scenario where the first nucleotide was just an ordinary standard, um, uh, standard nucleotide, and it was only at when the second, uh, the second nucleotide was attached that we have a di-terminator version. So there's some chance, we have a lot more of standard nucleotides in our mix than we do dideoxy nucleotides. So you can imagine that you might run quite some distance before you incorporate a dideoxy nucleotide and can extend the chain no further. 
that process is random. So it might be that you have an equal number of uh, five-letter complementary sequences as you do ten-letter nucleotide sequences. In practice, Sanger, uh, Sanger sequencing would typically run upwards of five or even six hundred nucleotides in length. So you need to have the right mix of, label, of, of dideoxy and ordinary nucleotides for uh, building these complementary sequences. All right, so having started with one template, we now have a, a, quite a collection of different length complementary sequences to it. We need to separate those complementary sequences of different length, and then the, the, uh, we, we can evaluate you know, what the pattern of labels are, because we've labeled the T nucleotides differently than we've labeled the G nucleotides, or the C's, or the A's. They each have a different color associated with them. So if we separate these complementary sequences, um, often through capillary electrophoresis, we will see that the order in which they come off tells us the sequence of letters in the original sequence. In this case, we see a red band, a red band, a yellow band, a red band, a blue band. You can see that these correspond to ever-increasing lengths of the uh, complementary sequences. So we can call that red band a, a T, the next red band a T, the next band is a, a yellow, that's a G. And so by seeing these successive colors, we are able to infer the sequence of the original template. Now that's quite different than the way massively parallel sequencing works. Massively parallel sequencing is, generally speaking, going to produce a very different kind of sequence. First off, in the old days, if you had a really top-end Sanger sequencer, you could sequence as many as 384 different template sequences all at the same time. And that was considered amazing high-end equipment back then. However, today's sequencers do not produce 384 sequences in a single run. They produce millions in a single run. So the, the scale-up, the, this massively parallel property of these sequencers implies that we're sequencing a far larger number of templates than was ever possible in Sanger sequencing equipment. There are some trade-offs, though. The number of, of sequences that we produce may be massive, but the lengths of sequences that we produce are almost always much smaller. So let's talk about uh, why that is. Well, first off, why are we able to sequence so many, uh, so many more templates at a time in a, in a massively parallel sequencing experiment? You remember that in the prior slide, when I was talking about Sanger, I noted that we were using capillary electrophoresis to separate the different complementary products for a single template strand. Well, that means that each DNA product, each DNA template you're sequencing takes up a capillary all by itself. And so if you have 384 capillaries in the instrument, that's how many sequences you can get out. We don't have capillaries in today's sequencers, though. Instead, we have a, a number of spots in a flow cell, typically. So you can imagine that this is our flow cell. Now, a real flow cell has space for millions of different sequence, uh, sequence uh, templates to be sequenced at once. But here, we're, we're drawing a cartoon where we've just drawn four, okay? So this T represents one piece of DNA to be sequenced, this A represents a spot corresponding to a different template to be sequenced, the C and the G. They, they start with different letters here, but that's just for convenience. Each of these spots is a different template to be sequenced. Now, I think people uh, remember that cartoons are, of course, not actually motion, our eyes just perceive them to be. The first frame that an animator draws shows the characters in one position, the next frame shows them in a very slight motion from that, the third frame shows them in a slightly different position, and our eyes stitch that together and say, ah, I see motion, even though what you're really seeing is a bunch of static images. In the same way, you can imagine this as a cartoon series, and this cartoon frame here is showing what happens when we allow a first nucleotide to be added to the substrate. So we see that T is showing up in this top, uh, in this top blob. Uh, um, so, this, uh, so T is the first letter that can be added from the three prime end of that particular template. In the second moment in time, we see that instead of a T being added, now an A is being added. At the third moment in time, we see another A is being added. So if we, if we just pay our attention to this leftmost template that appears in the, these cells, we see that first a G was added, then a C was added, then a T was added, then a G, then an A. 
And so from this, we can stitch together these moments in time to say that for this spot, this is the sequence of letters that are being incorporated, and from that, we get our complementary sequence. Because we have space for our cameras to record, or CCDs, to record millions of different templates all at the same time, we are able to track which letter is being incorporated at each position for each template over time. That's an astonishing advance over what was feasible back when I was in grad school. Now, you can already tell that we're going to have a lot of jargon come flying our way in the course of this lecture, so I'm, I'm trying to keep some of that separated out so that we can uh, keep track of these. So we start with a template. A template is the piece of DNA that we want to sequence. Um, in the old days, at least, when we uh, produced these template sequences, we were choosing them very carefully, often from uh, an insert that had been uh, uh, stored in, in a library. Uh, so um, if you hear me use the term insert, it's, it's kind of hearkening back to the fact that I, I got my training from an old uh, genome sequencing center at the University of Washington. So an insert is kind of our, our source material, and then we have the, the template bits, uh, or the, the bits on the ends of those sequence that we wish to determine sequence for. Okay, a read is the sequence corresponding to a single template, but it is the output from the sequencer. So a read may give us um, uh, high quality sequences throughout, and all of those base calls might be absolutely bulletproof, or they might be quite error prone. So it, we should be careful when we say that a read is the sequence complementary to a template. Well, maybe not. Maybe the sequencer made some errors along the way. So it's, it's kind of a potentially error prone stretch of sequence letters that represent the complement to the template sequence. Okay, I think most people will have heard of the term shotgun sequencing. This reflects that in the, the modern paradigm, rather than being very careful about which pieces of DNA we're going to sequence, we tend to rely on random sampling to say that if we can develop reads all over this genome, we'll be able to patch together most of it just based on the fact that we have millions and millions of reads to choose from. Okay, so shotgun sequencing reflects this scattershot approach to choosing where our, our templates are throughout the genome on a random basis. Okay, fold coverage is a term that shows up very frequently. Uh, you will see that a huge number of species out there have been sequenced. Some of them have been sequenced rather superficially, and some of them have been sequenced very deeply. The, the number of data sets that have gone into annotating the human genome is astonishing. But, if you were to look at something like the platypus, or the American alligator, or whatever, you would find that the depth of sequencing is considerably lesser, because people haven't invested so much time in sequencing experiments there. So if you have a 3 billion base um, uh, uh, genome, and you've produced 6, mil uh, 6 billion, twice as many, um, nucleotides in reads as you have in the genome, then you can, you can divide one by the other and say, well, that's a two-fold sequencing. Six billion, re, uh, six billion nucleotides produced in reads versus three billion in the actual genome. So if you have something like 30x coverage, um, in the case of the human genome, go, going from three billion to uh, 90 billion is, is quite a big boost in the, the number of nucleotides we're talking about. So fold coverage is simply the division of how many nucleotides you were able to get in reads Based, uh, divided by the number of nucleotides in the home genome. All right, so it's, it's worth talking for just a moment about whether newer is always better. There, there's a the presumption in our minds that that's always true, but there's always some sort of drawback with new technology. So let us start with the fact that Sanger sequencing typically produces much longer reads. These days, um, you're one of the longer uh, next-gen sequencers uh, from the, the kind of Illumina model will produce about 150 base pairs per read. It, but more generally, if you want really high throughput off the sequ sequencer, you will instead uh, configure it to generate like 50 or 60 base pairs per read. So that's pretty short compared to what Sanger would do. In the old days, uh, in a, in a well-run sequencing experiment, you would get 600 nucleotides per read. So that's already a pretty big boost. Sanger sequencing produces more accurate base calls, typically. The, the, the old-school way that we did sequencing would give us more confidence about each nucleotide in the sequence. Now, that said, if you have tens of thousands of reads covering a particular region, 
um, and, and you have just one from the, sang from the old school Sanger sequencing, take the, the new sequencing instead. Because by having, uh, by having hundreds of reads at a particular position, you are able to get a very great deal of confidence about what each nucleotide in your template really was because you have so many sequences covering that. So having a lot of reads helps to, complement, uh, helps to compensate for the fact that per, uh, per base call confidence is a little lower in today's sequencers. And of course, the, the key advantage of massively parallel sequencing is the fact that we have millions of reads, not hundreds. This is an incomparable benefit, and uh, it has dragged the cost of sequencing down quite a lot. Yes, an individual sequ sequencing experiment in a massively parallel sequencer is going to cost you a lot of money. But if you consider the cost per nucleotide uh, in, in, in a read, the cost is infinitesimal compared to what it used to be with Sanger-style sequencing. So let's talk a little bit about what the information for each read looks like. The, the reads that we see in Sanger sequencing derive from something called an electropharogram. I think you remember a few slides back we talked about each of the letters A, C, G, and T corresponding to a different color. Um, so here in, in this diagram we see that T is represented by a red dye, A is represented by a green dye, C is represented by a blue dye, and uh, in this case uh, G is represented by black. It's not a black dye obviously, but so each of these colors <clears throat> has this chance of waving up or down as a function of time in a capillary electrophoresis experiment. So we see that this green peak appearing at position 50 corresponds to the letter A. Um, the next letter uh, seen at position 51 is also a green peak. It's fallen down and come back up again. That tells us that we have another A there. So which which die is rising and falling in the space assigned to a particular base call is going to be how we infer what that letter is. So some of these are very nicely delineated. Here, for example, we have green, 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 red, red. We can read that manually to say A-A-A-T-T. -T. That's, that's easy. But look at some of the stuff that appears up here. Uh, in this region below 50, we have uh, some red peaks, which would make us think that they are T's. But you'll note that they aren't baseline resolved. It doesn't go all the way up to the top and then fall all the way back down to the baseline and then rise back up again and then fall back down again. So when we get to stuff like this, when we get to um, areas that are poorly resolved, it gets very difficult not only to say what letter is at that position, but uh, how many are there in a row. Now, I think most people will remember, if you took analytical chemistry, that the bigger a molecule is in comparison to the difference between it and its neighbor, the harder it is to separate them. What that means practically is that when you get up past 500 in uh, the number of nucleotides represented in the complementary sequence, um, the, the, the weaker the ability of capillary electrophoresis to tell those two fragments apart, 500 nucleotides versus 501 nucleotides, is, after all, a pretty small difference relative to their total size. So um, when we look at this region up here around 720 in the electropharogram, we see a green plateau. It's rising and then sort of wiggling back and forth a few times and then falling. We can interpret that that is a bunch of A's, but is it five A's? Is it four A's? It's really hard to tell. So in cases like that, we see that some parts of the electropharogram are such great quality that it's very hard to miss the base call. Some parts of the electropharogram, on the other hand, are very poorly resolved. We need to be able to put a, uh, a, an error probability on each letter of this, of this read. That brings us to FRED. FRED is a great algorithm. Uh, it was created all the way back in the 1990s. Now, you'll, you'll note that the publications, there are two, are back-to-back -back papers in the same journal, Genome Research, by Brent Ewing, and, uh, Brent Ewing sorry, Phil Green and, and some other researchers at the University of Washington, coincidentally. Um, I note that Phil Green is a perfectionist, and the man cares very fervently that every paper going out representing his lab is perfect before it goes to press. So, in fact, um, they were giving talks and seminars about the FRED algorithm at the time I entered grad school in 1996. It's only two years later that the, the, 
they felt that everything had been uh, solidified to a point that they felt ready to publish it. So some labs careen to papers just as quickly as they possibly can, and others tune and refine for quite a long time. So FRED is software that will produce reads in the first place and evaluate the probability of error for each of, those, uh, for each of the letters, the base calls in it. So we need to be able to infer sequence from an electropherogram. We need to be able to associate each with a probability of error for that letter. To give you a little bit of context, when the United States Congress voted money for the Genome Project, they declared as part of that legislation that it was not enough to simply produce a string of letters and say, behold, the human genome. Instead, they wanted to have a probability of error associated with those letters to say that at any given point in the, uh, in the announced genome, they would be able to say that this letter is correct with a less than 1 in 10,000 chance of error. So that's a rather specific kind of deliverable, and it's attached to the money. So necessarily, bioinformaticists were going to think about ways to accomplish that goal. So how do we do that? We start with trying to define what a base call should look like. We start with the, the declaration that each peak that we see in an electropherogram should match the beat of the, of the peaks around it. We're going to talk a little bit more about that as we discuss Fourier transforms in a moment. Only one trace is concave down at this call. So we can speak of each of the four colors that we saw in our electropherogram as a different trace. We have a green trace, we have a red trace, a blue trace, and a black trace. Each of those traces has some value at every point. So if you're at a T and you have a red peak there, there's probably still some amount of intensity seen for green, for blue, and for black. So the traces are continuous, they have samples at each of these places. Only one trace is concave down at this position. If you ever took calculus, um, hopefully I haven't just given you PTSD, but um, we have the, this memory that the first derivative of a, of a particular function tells you what the slope is at that position. The second derivative tells you whether the slope is rising or the slope is falling. If the slope is rising, you have something that's concave up. If the second derivative is falling, you have something that's concave down. In our case, when we see a, a signal rise and fall, we want to remember that, uh, that that represents concave down. So if you have multiple traces that are rising and falling together at a particular location, that's really worrisome. In the old days, that could mean that you were sequencing a person's genomic DNA at a spot where they had different alleles from mom and dad. So if you had a, a G from mom and a, a, an A from your dad, then both of those traces could be represented if you hadn't separated haplotypes in that way. All right, so what we see then is that we want to have only one trace producing this nice concave down shape. The other stuff is going to just be bouncing along on the baseline, hopefully. Highly probable errors are far away. Uh, this is the, this is kind of the crack house rule. When I moved to Nashville, I moved to a house that was in a, uh, 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 an up and coming neighborhood, as the realtors like to say. It's the hottest deal in Nashville. Come live in 12 South. I was very excited about it. But 12 South had been an area that had some social problems. And I, about a year after I moved into my house, I was looking around uh, the foundation to check if I'd had some damage from something, and I found a syringe, and I found myself worrying about this house that I bought for the first time. See, it was gorgeous when I moved into it. The, the house had been hollowed out entirely, and they'd built an altogether new kitchen, a glorious floor plan, wood, car uh, wood flooring everywhere. It was gorgeous. But what I hadn't understood was that the house had previously been the crack house uh, for Ninth Avenue. So that was embarrassing and frustrating. You see, before I moved in, that house had been a drag on everybody else's property values for blocks around. The next door neighbors were the most hit. Most hit. The people who lived a block away, maybe they were aware that there was a problem down there, but not really uh, all, that, uh, all that clued into it. But after my house sold, suddenly this, this, uh, this problem holding down property values for that neighborhood went away. And everybody was really excited to see that this house had finally uh, stopped being a, a weight on their property values. Okay, so in the same way, 
When you're looking at sequencing data, if you have a particular peak in your electropherogram that's just garbage, um, we don't assume that the garbage is limited to that one base call. We assume that it's hindering the base call probabilities on either side of it. And the closer you are to that erroneous, to that clearly garbage base call, the more that your score is going to be hurt, in very much the same way as property values are held down because of those folks who keep selling drugs. Okay. So, let's now talk about frequencies. Frequencies are a frequent topic in, in all sorts of areas of bioinformatics, but this is an area I think where it's really easy to understand. When we looked at our electropherogram a couple slides back, we saw that there was a regular arrival and fall of peaks in our electropherogram as a function of time. Beat, 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 beat. Yes, you can think of this as the, the beat in a song. If you're listening to house music, the, the, the key thing you're going to hear is not the lyrics, it's not the treble bit, it's the bass, the whoop, whoop, whoop. And so when you look at the electropherogram, if you read each of these as a whoop and you move your finger at the same pace across here, what you're going to hear is a characteristic frequency of bass calls in the electropherogram. So Fourier transforms represent our best way of recognizing the characteristic beat of these electropherograms. So what if we start by summing together the four channels of fluorescent intensity that we have, uh, the four traces. So, the, so we're no longer looking at whether something is an ACG or T, we're simply asking is there a wump at this point? Is there a peak appearing at this point in the electropherogram or not? And we don't care what color it is. So we want to decompose this time-dependent fluorescent intensity signal into a frequency, a characteristic frequency at which the peaks are appearing in the electropherogram. Fourier transform represents our way of revisualizing a time-dependent signal whether that's what you're hearing at a party or what the electropherogram is, is measuring as intensities for these traces, um, it's decomposing this time-dependent intensity signal into characteristic frequencies. Let's imagine this first uh, wave that we see. We see that it's got a pretty good amplitude, um, meaning it's, it's very high and very low above zero, um, and it's got a nice steady characteristic frequency that the, uh, the, the this, uh, the, the bandwidth is exactly the same throughout the, the course of this. As a result, when we decompose it into a frequency, we see that it has a frequency of two, meaning that it finishes a, uh, finishes a cycle every two units on our x-axis, um, and we put in another peak at negative two to say that, well, the, uh, these two signals together, uh, that effectively the, a plus two and a minus two frequency are the same thing here. So we have a high peak uh, in the Fourier transform to represent that this is an intense in signal, and its distance from the origin left or right tells us about its frequency. Look at this next waveform, though. See that this is a smaller amplitude. It doesn't rise as much or fall as much away from zero, and it's faster. It has a shorter wavelength, um, and as a result, it's going to be shown at a longer distance from zero to reflect the, uh, the higher frequency associated with it, but with a shorter peak than the first one because it's not as intense an amplitude. Then when we see a complex waveform like this one down here, we see that this is actually the sum of these two waveforms. If you add each uh, time sample here to each time sample here, you get this a very complex looking waveform. But in the FT space, we are still able to detect that this signal is the sum of those two original waveforms. We see that it still has the relatively intense uh, peak at this space and a higher, a higher frequency, lower amplitude signal further away from the origin. So Fourier transform represents our way of grabbing out frequencies from these time-dependent electropherogram signals. They, in turn, help us to discern what what is the predictable, plate, uh, the predictable spacing at which we should see peaks appear in the electropherogram? Okay, so now we are looking at how that predicted spacing compares to what we actually observe. In this case, we have our, our traces down below, and up at the top, 
we have these four arrows. Now these four arrows have, have come from this process of Fourier transform. We looked at the whole signal of the electropherogram, came away with, with these characteristic frequencies. Now our software has said, well, I expected to see a peak here, 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 and here. So for the second peak, it's dead on, right? I mean, we've got the predicted location being almost dead center on where this peak is centered. This first peak is a little lower than we would expect. In its predict uh, it's a little distant from its predicted time. So anytime we have this predicted location for a peak, we're able to detect that there's some shift between where the peak actually appeared and where we thought it would appear based on the Fourier transform analysis. So this, this distance is considered a, a mark of danger for a base call. If that base call is not centered on the, the place where you, the time where you expect it to be, you have some worries about the, the, uh, the probability of error for that base call. Now this next bit is something I think everybody needs to understand, and it's only because in proteomics, sorry, in bioinformatics, we so frequently have a, a need to express a very low probability in a, a way that uh, is, is easy to interpret differences between things. So imagine that you have a base call in uh, an electropherogram that has a 1% chance of error. That's pretty high. 1% chance of error is pretty close to the, the error, uh, to a rate where we would just say throw it out altogether. But we have a 1% chance of error for a particular peak. For another peak, we have a 1 in 1,000 chance of error. Now a 1 in 1,000 chance of error is actually still not great for sequencing data, but it's, it's considerably better than a 1 in 100 chance of error. Wouldn't you agree? So if you, if you think about where these would be plotted, if you, if you had an interval from 0 to 1, a, a, P, a, a probability of error of 1 in 100 and a probabil probability error of 1 in 1,000 appear very common, uh, very similar on, on this 0 to 1 interval. They're both way down here next to 0. And so our ability to tell them apart on a linear scale is not very great. However, if we look at them on a log scale, we can tell a 1% and a 0.1% error apart very easily. So a lot of times you will find that bioinformatics tools have used strategies like Fred did to represent these differences between very low probabilities. So the, the expression for it is to say the, the Fred score is negative 10 times the log base 10 of P, where P is the chance of error. Now, that might seem, you might look at that and say, it's an equation, I can't be bothered with that. But in, in fact, you need to be. Because lots and lots of tools in bioinformatics will express things on a negative log scale, will express probabilities on a negative log scale as a way to clarify their importance. <clears throat> so let's imagine a probability of 0.01. This is to say a 1%, a 1 chance of error at this base call. So in scientific notation, we would write that as 1e minus 2. So 10 raised to the negative second power times 1. That's the same thing as saying 1%. All of these, p of 0.01, 1e to the minus 2, 1%, they all mean the same thing. In a Fred score, we raise this exponent, uh, raise 10 to the power of this, this uh, negative exponent. So 1e minus 2 becomes a Fred score of 20, because remember, we're multiplying by negative 10 as well. The power for negative 10 was minus 2, 10 to the negative second power. So that becomes a minus 2 times minus 10, that's 20. So all of these different ways of expressing it are giving exactly the same information. A Fred score of 20 implies that we have a 1% chance of error at this location. Let's look at that as we drop the chance of error by tenfold at each step. So here we have a 1% chance of error. When we go to P.001, we have a 1 in 1,000 chance of error. We see then that the Fred score has risen from 20 to 30. So on a linear scale, they were both crammed up against the zero, but on this negative log scale, they're differentiating from each other quite nicely. 20 represents a 1% chance of error. 30 represents a 1 in 1,000 chance of error. A FRED score of 40 is equal to a 1 in 10,000 chance of error. So 
As we see, the closer and closer we get to zero with our probability of error, the higher the FRED scores go. The lower the probability, the higher the FRED score, and they rise um, by, by 10 every time you increase the, uh, uh, decrease the chance of error by tenfold. So a lower probability of error implies a higher FRED score. Shows up all over the place in bioinformatics, so be ready to recognize that. So when we output the data from our sequencers, we see that we have sequencing letters. These are our base calls. This is the, the read as represented in the file format. And we also have a series of letters here. So everyone should recognize that a fast queue is a file format that we use to represent the output from a sequencer. So we have a first line that basically gives the address to say, this is the spot in the flow cell that gave us this sequencing read. We have our letters that represent the, the base calls, and we have this line of characters that represents what Fred thought of each of them. You might say to yourself, Dr. Tab is not making any sense, because he was first talking about 20s and 30s and 40s as Fred scores, and now he's showing us letters and saying those are Fred scores. Well, in this case, bioinformatics is using a bit of shorthand. Uh, in this case, we have a whole bunch of letters in what's called the ASCII lookup table, where each number represents a certain character that can appear in a text file. Um, for example, capital A represents the number 65 in ASCII. So if you use the, the letter A in, in ASCII, that's represented by the number 65. Okay, so in this case, they're using a coding system where the, cap the, the letter capital A uh, is the value 32. Um, the first, the, the very lowest FRED score that can be reported is an exclamation mark. The very last one that can be reported is a tilde. A is the 32nd uh, in this series. So when you see the letter A, they're saying that the FRED score at this position is 32. Now I could ask you, what is the exact probability to which the score of 32 um, can be interpreted? And you might say, well, that's close to a Q value, a, a, a FRED score of 30. Therefore, I might say it's, it's a little bit lower than a 1 in 1,000 chance of error. So we see then that it's much more compact to write just one letter to represent each FRED score than to write a series of numbers. So in this case, each letter of this string is one quality score to describe one base call that appears above it. It's kind of an odd trick, but it's a thing that we do all the time. You might see um, a file that's, that's uh, got a name like whatever.fastq. That's possible. Very frequently, though, we see that people compress these data very, very tightly by using something like gzip or bz2. These, are, these extensions reflect the fact that this file has been compressed very, very heavily before it's been sent to you. So you can't just open a bz2 or gz file in your text editor, typically. You need to uncompress it first, and then you can look at it. However, a lot of the tools that we use for dealing with FASTQ files anticipate that they will be given to you in compressed form, so many of them can actually read a FASTQ bz2 or a FASTQ gz to help you. One of the most common tools that we use to sniff a FASTQ file and check its quality is FASTQC, and it's available for free from this, uh, this URL that we have up here. In this case, we are not looking at a single read. We're looking at an entire fast queue of reads. So we probably have millions of different, uh, of different reads represented in this one graph. And in this case, we are looking at the first nucleotide of each read, the second nucleotide of each read, and so on up to the 40th. This, this is a short read, massively parallel sequencing experiment. For each of these different positions, averaged across all of the reads, we're asking what are the typical FRED scores observed at this position. So you can see that the medians start quite high, around 39. A FRED score of 39 is, as we experienced a couple slides ago, about a 1 in 10,000 chance of error at this position. So we see that at the start, the medians just stay at that high level of 39 or 40. There's a couple cases where it falls below. But now, finally, as we, as we get closer and closer to the end of this, we see that more frequently these box plots are trending downward. 
which is to say that the, the further you get into a short read, the, the lower, uh, well, the greater the chance of error for uh, contemporary sequencers. They're still quite high. The median value was still, I, I believe, 38 in this case uh, for the 40th position. But we see that some of these reads have very dangerous, uh, have very dangerous FRED scores associated with them. How do you interpret a FRED score? What's good enough? The FASTQC gives you a bit of shorthand that you can work with. You see that this region between red and yellow cuts off at a score of 20, which is to say that FASTQC believes that if your base call has a greater than 1% chance of error, they consider that trash. That's why they're coloring it red. It's a very intuitive system. If your base call lies between 20 and 28, FASTQC will flag it as a yellow, a yellow light, saying um, it may be a caution zone. But if you have a FRED, a FRED score higher than 28, generally speaking, that, that means a 1 in 1,000 or lower chance of error. FASTQC says you're, you're in the green, you're in a, a great place, keep doing exactly what you're doing. So this is a fast way to interpret whether a sequencing experiment was a success or a failure. And certainly the quality of your data at this early stage will have all kinds of implications for the data analysis that follows downstream. With that, we come to our intermission, and I hope that you will hang in here for the second part of this video to take place in just a couple seconds. But for now, stop and have some tea. And welcome back. All right, so we've already talked about sequencing technologies, and we've talked about how we get probabilities of error from individual base calls. In the second part of the talk, we're going to discuss how we turn these reads into sequence information, really. Uh, so our principle here will be to, to separate this along two lines. One is the use of mapping technologies, and the other is the technology of assembly. You might think of these as mutually exclusive, like you either use mapping or you use assembly. Generally, that's going to be the, the model we work with in this lecture. But I would simply note that in some cases, we use mapping to deal with the reads that are good matches for our genome annotation, and we use assembly for those unmapped reads, the parts that can't be mapped to our sequence annotation. So mapping is defined as just trying to determine where each read in our sequencing experiment matches to the annotation that we have for that genome. Um, generally speaking, if you are using exome sequencing or whole genome shotgun sequencing, you are likely to use mapping, especially if your destination is to do variant calling, to say, what are the reads that differ by one nucleotide from what the annotation says should be at this location? Assembly is used much more frequently in the de novo context. This is a case where we don't know what the whole genome looks like, and we may be doing our, um, our we may be producing the sequencing experiment just to tell us what the whole sequence looks like. But if, if you have a reference sequence to compare to, rather than doing assembly, it's a much, uh, a much bigger gain for you. It's, a, it's far faster to do something like mapping than it is to do assembly. It's also a bit more error prone to do assembly. So in assembly, we're likely trying to, to assemble contigs, regions of contiguous sequence, that represent the overlaps that we see among reads. More about that in a moment. This is quite necessary if you're working in a non-model organism, because lots of non-model organisms have either um, no genome available, although that's getting rarer and rarer, especially for large animals, um, uh, but it's, it's also quite necessary in cases where you have a very poor quality genome one that's been derived from something like 2x coverage, for example, is likely to benefit quite a lot from assembly. So why do we emphasize mapping so much? Why, why is it that aligning short reads to reference uh, a reference database sequence is such a popular route? We, well, we start with the fact that assembly, um, starting from scratch, from uh, doing a de novo uh, assembly, um, is really time-consuming and is really error-prone. Um, whereas mapping can be done on a, a more conventional computer, we frequently find that assembly is going to require a, a dedicated workstation running Linux 
with 256 gigs of RAM, and at present, those machines are not found in just every laboratory. Recognizing sequence variants is a whole lot easier if the annotation tells you what the typical base call should be at each position. So, naturally, any model organism, sorry, any reference genome is going to represent probably just one canonical letter at each position, the wild type sequence for that organism. And any individual of that, orga of that uh, organism is going to differ at, at some set of locations anyway. Uh, so if you have a known wild type sequence, finding those, those variants that are particular to this individual uh, is a lot easier, just uh, it is really only feasible under the mapping con uh, context. Now, I, I think it's been apparent from, this, from uh, early in this lecture that massively parallel sequencers generate millions of reads. Um, a lot of these can produce more than 100 gigabase pairs of sequence a day. So, uh, with that kind of data volume, your ability to keep up with data collection probably means choosing the most efficient route for making sense of those data that's possible. In this case, that's probably mapping rather than assembly. Trimming, uh, sorry, quality control, trimming, and alignment processes are really commonly expected for all of the systems we use downstream to turn our data into information. So if you haven't done a, a mapping of your reads to the, the reference, it's very difficult then to move on to do a lot of the advanced uh, sequence analytics that we'd like to do. So mapping has become very popular for all of those reasons. Now I would say that the, the Burroughs-Wheeler transformer or uh, Burroughs-Wheeler aligner, uh, Burroughs-Wheeler alignment algorithm um, are not the best understood of the tools out there even if they're very widely used. So I'm going to try to explain these uh, in, in a fairly gentle way. There are going to be some places where the, my, uh, uh, my detail of the algorithm will be less than complete, so if you're a computer scientist watching this, I would advise you to watch any of the videos or read any of the papers or look at any of the tutorials online for the algorithmic um, insights of this. At the moment, my goal is that biomedical students have some notion of what BWA is doing for them. Okay, so let's start with the fact that Burroughs and Wheeler um, are not great bioinformaticists. That's not what they're known for. Uh, Burroughs and Wheeler are, uh, are pictured down here at the bottom right. Um, and in computer science, they're both quite legendary individuals. Um, but their, their experience was not in the space of bioinformatics, as I said. So um, Burroughs was widely associated with the creation of, the, of a, a programming abstraction called a subroutine. Uh, so he was a, a very early computer scientist who made this very valuable uh, way of organizing our code available to us. Wheeler um, was probably much better known uh, back when I was in grad school because he created a search algorithm um, uh, for searching the web. Um, so before uh, tools like Google were uh, everyday, everyday words, uh, Wheeler had created a, a search engine called Alta Vista for the digital corporation. Uh, so, both of these guys are really heavy hitters in the space of computer science, and yet this algorithm, Burroughs-Wheeler, uh, and, and the transform and alignment algorithm from it, um, is, is, is just another way that their innovations can be applied in the context of bioinformatics. So, we're, we're absolutely willing to steal our best ideas from sound engineers, or uh, in the case of Fourier transform, or uh, from, uh, from search engine gurus and so on, to find the best way that each particular application in the space of bioinformatics can be carried out. So let's, let's start in the abstract. I have a sequencing read. It is, let us say, 60 nucleotides long, and I want to find where it fits in the human genome. So if you imagine this as something you would do on your desktop, you might imagine that you have a Word document containing the entire human genome. 3 billion nucleotides long. So it's pages and pages of A's, C's, G's, and T's. You now want to search for where, um, and let us assume that it hits just one place, but maybe it hits multiples. Um, I want to find all the locations in the human genome where this read is a perfect match. So one of the things you might consider doing then is in your Word document, you can hit Control F for find, and then you type in the sequence of the read, and then you hit Next and see uh, if, if your read shows up perfectly anywhere in that annotation. 
And it might take several seconds uh, for something that is 3 billion nucleotides in length. And let us keep in mind that you don't want to do this for one read. You want to do this for millions of reads. So if you have a process that takes one minute for one sequence to be searched throughout this genome, and you have millions of sequence reads that you want to compare against that genome, imagine then that you have millions of minutes required for you to find the, every instance of each read in the genome. Clearly, that's way, way too slow. So let me imagine a different way that we can go about doing this. Imagine that I'm typing in a sequence from my reads, and it, this one happens to start with G. So I type the letter G. Now we see that every location in the genome that has, a, that has any G is highlighted in, in yellow now. Okay, well that's about one in four of the positions, so it doesn't answer our question, where is this found? It only shows us where the first letter is found. Well, now I type the second letter, uh, A, so I have the sequence GA. So now we have a big cut down. Before, one in four of the letters in the genome were all highlighted in yellow to say, this is where you can find a G. Now we're only finding the locations where G, A are found together. Well, that's much, much smaller. That's only like one in 16 of all locations in the genome. Then I type a third letter, T. Now only the locations that are G, A, T are highlighted in our database. And then I add A again. Now even fewer, one in, one in, 64, one in 64 locations. No, I'm sorry, I got that backward. Yeah, <laughs> four or 16. Each case, we're cutting down by four how many locations in the genome match up to this. By the time you type the 60th letter, there are very, very few locations that, um, that are lit up at all because they have to match all of these matching criteria, all of the letters I've entered. How do you create a magical index that can do something like that? That is the question that animates the, the Bros wheeler algorithm. The Bros wheeler algorithm creates an index such that you can very rapidly um, progress down a tree of locations to get to just those that match a long sequence. It's a bit of magic, but I'm going to try to walk through that magic for you. Let us imagine that we have the sequence G A T G C G A blah 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 blah. This is not a read, this is in this case the entire genome, but in this case we're going to limit to just this as our entire genome because the entire genome obviously is not going to fit on this slide. So let us imagine GATG. Our first step is to create something called a suffix array, a suffix array, which is to say that we want to pull out the three prime end of this sequence and keep building by one letter from it. So our first suffix is just the letter G. It's at the three prime end. The second suffix is TG. Our third suffix is ATG. Our fourth suffix is GATG. We want to create an array of all of those suffixes. And then we're going to do a little bit of magic and sort it. So in this case, having uh, pulled this aside, we see that uh, we have a special character showing up in here, a dollar sign. This is to represent the end of a sequence. So our first suffix, G, uh, skips over 12 letters from the start here to give us just G dollar sign. That's the end of the, the, end of the sequence. TG is represented here. You see that this one said I had to skip 12 letters and then it was G dollar sign. Here we see this one says I'm skipping 11 letters and then it's TG dollar sign. All right, so we can find every suffix of this sequence represented in this array and we've sorted it. And we've sorted it alphabetically. So all of the A sequences appear before all of the C sequences, which appear before all of the G sequences, etc. What Burroughs and Wheelers realized was that if you are able to retain just the letter that comes before each of these suffixes and, how, uh, and what position they occupy within the sequence, you're able to reconstruct the original sequence from the suffix array and you're able to compress the heck out of the sequence. Just compress it way, way down. So this process of making a suffix array is the first step in making an index so that you can ask where any sequence appears in this much longer genome annotation. All right, so I've added another slide on this versus an earlier uh, version of these slides because I think that this gets a little clearer if I show it another way.
Imagine that I have, in this case, the sequence Google uh, that's been uh, produced in a suffix array. In this case, they, uh, they're simply rotating the sequence. So Google dollar sign is our original string, and then we've rotated it one to the left to make Oogle. We rotate that one to the left to make Ogol. We rotate that one to the left to make Gol, then all, then L, then empty. And in this case, we're simply showing the other, the other letters that we've rotated uh, showing up at the end. So in this case, we're going to sort the string alphabetically, and we see that dollar sign Gugo shows up first, Gal go, <laughs> Galgu, and so on uh, show up. This is now sorted so that all the G sequences precede the L sequence, precede the O sequence. The letter that comes before this suffix has been set aside. You see how it's been pushed into its own column? This is called the Burroughs Wheeler transform of the original sequence, along with these offsets, which is to say, how much did we rotate to get to this? So if you have the offsets, plus you have that initial letter, you, it is possible to recreate the string that you uh, put in here in the first place. All right, so if you compress these data, they compress beautifully. But um, this is, the, the point here is not so much compression as it is to create something that we call a try. This is a prefix try, which is to say um, that we want to know where all sequences starting with G R, or all sequences starting with G O R, or all sequences starting with G O O are located. So this try represents our way of, uh, represents our index. But here, instead of storing just the silly nonsense string Google, it contains all subsequences of the human genome. That is a massive tree structure. However, it has this unique possibility that when we have some read, we can say, well, our first letter is an A. I'm going to follow the, the, the branch of the tree that goes the A route. Okay, the next letter is C. I'm going to follow the next branch of the tree down the C route. That's kind of magical. This is exactly what we were talking about, a, a, a magical search system where I can type a long string into, into Word, and as I type, fewer and fewer positions are highlighted in this genome reference. So Burroughs Wheeler starts with a suffix tree, makes a Burroughs Wheeler transform of it, which is itself a, a, a try that we can use to, to find immediately the position of any long string in this much longer genome annotation. Bit of magic, but it does work. I, I should mention one other thing. Um, that this paper that I'm, I'm, I'm quoting from here is showing all this, uh, the, the, this dotted line path here to show uh, an off by one search. So in, we, we've talked about the importance of being able to find sequence variants. So you can see in this case that um, having a, a, the, the try structure allows us to do matching of strings that differ by one or by up to two or by up to three letters from what's present in the genome. That is incredibly powerful. Um, so the, the, this dashed line business is trying to show how off by one errors can be tolerated as we search for LOL in Google. Obviously there is no LOL in Google, but GOL, if you tolerate one mismatch, can match LOL, which is what they were trying to show with this particular figure. So the output from one of these systems is typically a BAM or SAM file. Uh, SAM files were very slightly earlier. They were a, a text way to represent an alignment, a mapping between a bunch of, refer a bunch of reads and a reference annotation for the genome. Um, it, over time, we, we've shifted to writing these in a binary format rather than a big text file format. So SAM and BAM are the same thing. They're sequence alignment maps. Um, in, in the BAM format, they're stored in a binary fashion. So we have, again, just a whole bunch of text, but if you've never seen one, it can be rather difficult to interpret. So there's often a header that describes things like what, uh, what FASTQ file did these reads come from, which version of the sequence annotation did it be aligned to, etc. And then the records themselves have structured read information. So each read that we had in our FASTQ, we're now going to report a record that specifies where that sequence came from, 
um, where within the, the genome it has been aligned, what is the map quality score, which is to say um, if, you, uh, if you had a perfect match for every letter of your read to every, um, every nucleotide that appeared in that part of the annotation, you end up with a better and better match quality score. Um, we have things like cigar strings that are very useful for us to report when there's a, an off by one letter change within the sequence. Um, we have information about whether um, a paired end has been observed for this, something that's going to be a very big deal when we get into assembly. The read sequence itself, quality score is built around it, and some other metadata. So a, a, a SAM file is not all that easy to read um, by eye, but it is intended to make it possible for you, for example, to grep through for the name of a particular uh, read to ask where it's been annotated. So the, the SAM format is, is texty enough you can get at that. Generally speaking, SAM and BAM files are for reading by other software these days. Um, but initially, at least, that was a, a little different. Okay, which brings us away from the, the questions of sequence mapping, where we aligned reads to a known reference database for the entire genome, to a, what, the sort of thing that people who work in non-model organisms do more, more frequently, which is to deal with sequence assembly. So why do we need assembly? Why, it, I've already talked about how much more efficient and um, lower memory requirement um, we, we find sequence mapping to be. So why do we have to introduce assembly at all? Well, we've got millions of short reads, but we need scaffolds. Ideally, you would have one scaffold representing every chromosome uh, in your species. If that's not available for you to just download, you're probably going to have to have some ability to do this. Even if we could, map our reads to an annotation, there are going to be plenty of times where there are reads in our data set that have not mapped successfully to the genome. Maybe you allowed for one or even two or three uh, nucleotide errors in the mapping and it still failed to deal with the, this million reads that you have set on the side. In a case like that, you probably want to know what they represent and assembly is one way to get that information. So it might be that you just work in a non-model organism that lacks any reference genome annotation. We work, for example, in hyena. Um, because we're working in hyena, we are without a reference genome at this time. Maybe that'll change, you never know. But um, while we are trying to understand the sequencing data we can get from hyena, we must rely upon assembly rather than mapping because we don't have an annotation to work with. So let's walk through some of the definitions associated with this. A contig is a continuous length of genomic sequence in which the order of bases is known to a high confidence level. It's a very dry kind of uh, definition, but it's, it's what we got. So I would note then that if you have a pair of reads that cover very, very close locations in the genome, it might be, for example, that the last 30 nucleotides of this read map to the first 30 nucleotides of this read. And if they align perfectly, that's good news. Now I can make an assembly that spans from the beginning of one to the end of the other, and it's an unbroken series of letters that I have across that. So by intersecting, by, by detecting the overlaps of my sequencing reads, I can infer contigs out. All right. Now, scaffolds are built of contigs. So it might be that I have a region of unbroken sequence over here and another region of unbroken sequence over here. These are contigs. And I also happen to know that these two are close to each other. I might also know the orientation of one versus the other. Like this one might be on the coding strand or the anti-coding strand, and I need to be able to discern which of those two is, is, is the case. So a scaffold is not just going to say these contigs are close together. It's going to say, relatively speaking, are they in the same strand or opposite strands? Okay. Uh, right. So let's imagine a kind of challenging scenario for assembly. This is one where we do not have what's called paired end information. Each read then stands on its own. So if my genome started this way and I produced reads that look like this, I can project downward through this pile and say, I know every letter from this position to this position because these reads all overlap on each other in a way that tells me I have unbroken sequence through this stretch. Great. I similarly have a contig that I've built out of the neighboring stretch. 
But if each of these reads are independent of each other, I don't have any way of knowing that this contig happens to be right downstream of that contig, or that this one is right next to that one. I just know contig, 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 and they're not given in that order, they're given in a set of millions of such contigs. Problematic. So from this, I want to be able to get scaffolds to say these two happen to be very close together, they have an unknown map, uh, a mass, uh, unknown number of nucleotides in between them, um, but to, to know their relative orientations and positions. Generally speaking, if you're trying to make cont uh, contigs into scaffolds, you're going to find that having paired end sequences is a really, really big help for you. So imagine then that you have some stretch of DNA. I've been talking about mostly template DNA, which is to say the bit we're actually going to sequence. But you'll notice there are two places that I'm going to sequence here. My long piece of DNA may be thousands of nucleotides in length. Let's say it's 10, uh, 10 kilobases, for example. That's 10,000 nucleotides. I see that I can produce a little patch of sequence at this end, and I can create another patch of sequence at this end. I know then that these two sequences are on opposite strands, and they are relatively close to each other. It might seem like 10,000 nucleotides is not that close, but in fact, you know, when a gene can be a million nucleotides in length, these um, <laughs> that 10,000 nucleotides is just it's a chip shot within the uh, within the, the genome. They're very close together. So knowing that this read and that read come from nearby pieces of DNA is invaluable for us to get to scaffolds. Paired end sequencing is the way that we achieve that. So I, I want to try then to represent this slide in a way that, that will make clear sense. Imagine that each of these light blue lines represents a different physical piece of DNA. Each of these physical pieces of DNA has a large region of unknown length and unknown sequence in the middle of it. I have a sequencing read at the, the five prime end, and I have another sequencing read at the three prime end, but I know neither the sequence nor the length of the stretch that separates them, just that they're one piece of DNA, probably less than 10,000 nucleotides. All right. So when I do my sequencing, I am choosing random inserts here. I'm choosing random pieces of DNA for sequencing, but each of them I'm going to sequence both ends of it. So what we end up with is a huge number of pieces of DNA that have been sequenced, and we find that these regions of known sequence that we've produced from each end of them can be overlapped against each other, and we can project downward through them to say, ah, we have every bit of this covered in the ends of sequences. It could be, from, it could be a combination of right-hand pieces and left-hand pieces of sequence. We can project downward through them. That means that we can make these contigs that represent regions that we know from end to end have been perfectly sequenced. We also know, however, that this contig and that contig must be near each other because they, they, uh, the, the contig on the left contains one end of the piece of DNA and the contig on the right contains the other piece of sequence that came from the same piece of DNA. So these paired ends begin telling us how to string together these contigs and what orientation they're in relative to each other. I would just note that I got this figure from Jared Roach. Um, Jared Roach was a friend of mine in grad school, um, and I always thought of, it, thought of him as that guy who was always wearing interesting bow ties, who had kind of a, a weird take on life. He was also a Go master. Uh, what I didn't realize was that Jared was busily writing up a paper that introduced the statistics, uh, the statistical underpinnings of paired end sequencing when he was in grad school, and is well well known as a uh, as, as one of the originators of the sequencing assembly approach. So I, uh, it's always odd when the the people who are just our friends in grad school go on to do these astonishing things with their careers. Brilliant guy. All right. Now I'm going to talk about one of the most vexing problems for us to deal with in genome assembly, and that is repetitive DNA. Now up here I've simply written it's non-coding DNA, which is kind of an unfair way to characterize it. 
We have lots and lots of places in our genomes that look like genes that are not genes. We also have lots and lots of places in our DNA that have clearly non-random sequences because they consist of nothing but GA, 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 GA endlessly for huge stretches of space. So I thought it would be valuable to talk for just a moment about the stuff that isn't non-coding, uh, that isn't protein coding genes, that isn't RNA coding genes, but rather the fine world of transposable evidence, uh, transposable elements and variable number tandem repeats. Repetitive DNA tends to fall into the world of many satellites and microsatellite sequences. We have lots and lots of transposable elements uh, that have also made, home, made their homes in our DNA. Uh, DNA. There, there's a uh, kind of a loose theory that I, I really enjoy that about the time humanity was separating from the other primates um, in, in evolutionary space, uh, there was a, a war going on in our genomes that a, a particular sequence called the ALU, uh, what, this is a, a short interspersed repeat element, um, here called a, a sign, was replicating itself throughout the human genome. And at, at about the time we were separating from, uh, from gorillas and chimpanzees and so on, uh, our, our genomes had developed a way to limit the, the further growth of these ALU sequences throughout our genomes. So um, uh, changes in DNA methylation, etc., have, have taken place. But today, if you, if you were to look for um, how many times an ALU sequence appears across your genome, you would find it's in a bazillion locations. In fact, I, I, one of the estimates says that every 20 human births equates one more addition of the ALU to, a, to that genome. So, um, we find then that pseudogenes and things that, 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 that these retrotransposons that we see um, show up at a huge number of locations within our genomes. So why is that a problem? Let's examine uh, two pieces of DNA. Here's a, a piece of DNA where gene A appears next to gene B. Nothing too surprising there. But in between them, we have some repeat, or an, maybe an ALU sequence or something. In another piece of DNA, we have gene C separated from gene D. But they also have this very same repeat sequence appearing between them. So if you had a sequencing read, X, that starts in gene A and continues into that repeat, and another read that starts in a, in a repeat, but it runs into gene D, de novo assembly would have no way of knowing that gene, uh, that the read X does not intersect with gene Y to create a contig. You see why well, that's a problem. Now, just because multiple genes may be found near this repeat sequence, the software erroneously thinks that they belong together, that they can be overlapped on each other. So these repeat, th this, this repetitive DNA can go a long way towards making spaghetti out of our attempt to build uh, scaffolds out of our, our data. Now, you're getting a little bit of a look at the history of sequence assembly as well. I would, I would note that in the early days, there were a lot of people who felt that an overlap, layout, and consensus strategy was what we needed to make sense of that. So I'm going to try to relate what each of these terms mean. Imagine that you have a part of the genome that starts with a blue gene, continues to a repeat, has a green gene, a red repeat again, a light blue gene, a repeat again, and finally a yellow gene. Okay, so this is just some piece of, of uh, genome that, that has this particular structure. We produce reads from it, and we see that we have some that are dark blue entirely, which is to say they fit in that first gene, some that start in dark blue and continue into red, which is to say they extend across this boundary between the two, some that are red only, some that are red extending into green, which shows that they're in that second position, and so on. These reads tell us the whole story, but there are multiple stories that can be told from them. You could imagine a layout graph that shows, well, I'm sorry, the, I should start with the term overlap. The overlap is simply referring to the fact that these reads have regions where they overlap with each other. This is the basis upon which we call contigs from them. Okay, so you could imagine then that the layout graph would start with 
reeds found entirely in the blue region. Then we have reeds that cross from the blue region, in, uh, the dark blue region, into the red region. Others that are contained entirely within the repeat region. Some that merge from red into green, and so on. These arrows then represent possible ways that we can lay out these different reeds that have come from here. So it might seem then that there are lots of different ways that we can interpret this. We know in our heart of hearts that this starts with a dark blue region that continues to a red, that continues to a green, etc. You can see that path is shown here. But the data don't tell us that. The data tell us that there are many paths here. And so we frequently use the, a, a visualization of this called the, the brain graph to show uh, all these different transitions that could be done to walk through this coding region. And here you see that the repeat is this great organizing element because it, it stands between everything. The dark blue to green transition is mediated by going through the repeat. The dark green to light blue is mediated by going through the repeat, etc. So in the old days, we frequently figured that we want to find the path through all of our sequencing data that lets us use each sequence in succession. So if we can touch each read and say, this read belongs in the genome at this and only this position, that would be great. The algorithms for that were called Hamiltonian path generators. And there was a really big problem in that Hamiltonian path generators are NP-complete. If you're a computer scientist and I say NP-complete, you might have just facepalmed a little bit because NP-complete problems vex us. There's no way to make those algorithms really, really efficient. You can make things that approximate it, that, that get to pretty good solutions, but solving those problems in a way that is authoritatively right is very difficult to do. These days, we use a rather different approach, one that starts with a KMER catalog and one that continues to create Wehlerian paths. So we're going to try to walk through this bit by bit. Imagine that we are trying to find every uh, every different uh, sequence of 25 nucleotides that can be found in our reads. That might be a little bizarre. So um, our reads, if they came from a short read sequence or something like the Illuminas, um, might have come with um, say 40 nucleotides. That might be a very common length. So if we well, so if we have a 40 nucleotide read, we could imagine a 25 mer that starts at the first nucleotide. So Nucleotides 1 through 25, that's our first KMER. Nucleotides 2 through 26, that's our second KMER. Nucleotides 3 through 27, that's our third KMER. So you can see that we can, we can cut up this relatively long sequence of 40 nucleotides into 25 nucleotide KMERs. But we're not going to do that for just one read. We're going to do that for millions of reads. And we're going to keep track of, of all of the different uh, <laughs> of all of the different KMERs that are observed in any of these millions of reads. Having done that, we can then sort them, which is to say that if the same KMER were seen in 10,000 reads, we would be able to get a histogram to say, this KMER is really popular, this other KMER shows up only once, but this one shows up 10,000 times. One of the things that we can do is to say, this KMER appears too many times, we believe it represents a repeat, and throw it out. Now, it's not going to be there interfering with your production of contigs. Because it was so popular, uh, it represents this, this junction point that allows you to hook together basically any two parts of the genome. That's not okay. So we can throw those out. So when we have overlapping reads, I, mean, I think we said that we were using reads of length 40 nucleotides. So if you have two, nuclei, uh, two reads that overlap by at least the length of the KMER catalog, in this case 25, then you can say these are okay to join together to make a contig. If you have two reads that overlap by only five nucleotides, you're no longer going to be able to connect those because they don't contain a shared KMER. I hope everyone can see why. You would have this problem that your software might try to join together KMERs that have only three or four nucleotides in common, that would be hugely problematic because three or four nucleotides is nowhere near specific enough to legitimately connect two uh, reads.
Okay, so having created a catalog of all of the k-mers that we can find in any of the reads, we now are able to think of this as a graph. So imagine that we had our long, uh, our, our, our read, uh, it's, it's been subdivided into k-mers. These k-mers can then be thought of as a graph to say, I want to step from A, T, G, G, A, A, C to this next one, which is T, G, G, A, A, G, T. Everyone sees why that's possible? Because the second k-mer extends the first one by one letter, T, and otherwise uh, is a perfect match for the, for the other k-mer. So we started with, the, uh, with reads, we've turned them into a set of k-mers. These k-mers, in turn, form a graph that we can progress through in order to get our Debrain graph. But we do it not by attempting to visit each sequence one time, but rather to visit each edge one time, where the edge represents a link between success, successive k-mers that differ by just one letter in position. All right, so to return to this question of how we determine which contigs belong together in a common scaffold means that we need to be able to recognize that this contig has a whole bunch of pieces of DNA in it, a whole bunch of reads in it, that are associated with reads on the other end of those pieces of DNA that exist in another contig. You can see in this case that contigs A, B, and C are all uh, able to be put in order because the pieces of DNA that appear uh, uh, with reads in A also have reads in B. The pieces of DNA that have reads in B also have reads in C. Therefore, we know that these three belong next to each other in the same reading, uh, sorry, in the same coding strand, in the same sense. Okay. Um, you could imagine much more complex scenarios than this. Imagine this case where this contig, this contig, this contig, this contig, that contig, and that contig all have these shared relationships. After all, some of these uh, very long pieces of DNA may stretch across uh, from one contig to another, and yet those two contigs are not side by side. They may be separated by another contig. So we have these, this problem that we need to be able to untangle these relationships where some relatively short inserts go from contig A to contig B, some relatively long inserts go from contig A to contig C. That kind of de decomposition can take a little bit of processing power to resolve. But the end of this is that we produce what's called a scaffold, which is to say these contigs belong in this sequence from each other, in, in this order across the, the larger uh, uh, chromosome, and, and that they belong in this orientation. That's the definition of scaffold. So how do, you, how do you know whether assembly has worked or not? You might think, well, this is great. I, I, I simply do a bunch of reads. Maybe I do 50 million reads for my sample. I do a de novo assembly from it, and out pops a chromosomal sequence. Sadly, it is not quite that clean by any stretch. Generally speaking, any de novo assembly process is going to generate some very large contigs, some very large scaffolds, and they're also going to produce some very small scaffolds. That is a messy problem. So you can imagine then that I have used the same sequencing experiment, but I've used two different de novo assemblers on them. So in this case, I have um, a, a contig of 2,600 2, nucleotides, 2,200 nucleotides, 1,010, 650, 400, etc. So we, we're, we're ordering now all of the contigs that came from, uh, from this assembler, from the largest to the smallest. And we remember what's the total size of all of them jammed together. Then we say, if we put a line at 50% the total, what contig does it cut through? So here we had uh, just over 7,000 uh, nucleotides in the total contig size. We've thrown a bar through this at the line 3,600, and uh, because that's half of the total length, and we see that the contig it cuts through is 2200. In this case, we had maybe 7400. Um, Got to do the math in my head. 3500. <laughs> 35, so um, we, uh, we we put our line through at about 3900. In this case, 
it falls on the uh, contig that has a size of 1200. So which contig it cuts through, the size of the, the, the contig that it cuts through at this midpoint, is something that we call the N50 score for an assembly. The N50 score is trying to tell us something about a typical contig size um, that, that is representative of how well assembly went. The notion being that if you have a higher N50, it means that the software was able to put the, the DNA into larger and larger contigs than something that had a smaller uh, N50 score. So if, you have, uh, if you've seen that multiple assemblers have been used on a particular data set, the, the one with the largest N50 score is likely to be the one that has the most, um, the, the largest contiguous blocks of, of DNA that have been constructed from it. Frequently, we find that the database annotations um, are provided in, in something called the FASTA format. This comes from a search engine that was written back in 1988. Uh, when you get to the lecture on sequence alignment, um, the tools like FASTA will be represented. Um, I, I think most people have heard of BLAST. It's one of the, the successors of this algorithm. So what we see is that we have annotation and we have sequence letters. So the annotation here is giving us an accession number to say this particular protein in the ensemble database is of, of, of sequence type protein. It comes from this chromosome in this particular annotation of the human genome. It has uh, these positions within the, the genome annotation, has this gene symbol and this transcript symbol associated with it. And finally, we get down to the description of what this particular protein does. An SHC adapter protein number one, it's got the gene symbol, uh, sorry, the, <laughs> it's got piles of information uh, made available about it. The way that this information gets structured across different FASTA formats is highly arbitrary. Lots of different FASTA database generators are out there, and each of them provides their annotation in a different formatting in each case. The way that these sequences get reported also differs a bit which is to say that we have only one line of the text file that corresponds to an accession uh, to the descriptive information and then the following lines are all sequence 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 and it's only when we get to the end of the file or we get to another greater than sign another protein description that we know that we're we finished reading the sequence for the, for the last one it may be that they present the sequence as one uninterrupted line of text or it might be that it's chopped for example, at the 60th character, so sequence, the first line of sequence gives us 60 letters, the second line of sequence gives us 60 letters, third line of sequence, and so on, until we get to a line uh, that represents the end of the sequence, and it doesn't flesh out to 60 characters because it doesn't have that many in it. Okay, so FASTA databases are really easy to read. They're just descriptions and sequence letters. And FASTA files can be easily read in any text editor, essentially. So FASTA files are very good to know about for that reason. So lots of closing thoughts that come from this. We, we start with the fact that Fred has been our friend and that when we have uh, sequencing reads, Fred is able to tell us how confidently we can read each letter of that sequence. If something has a high probability of error, a Fred score of 20 or less, then we're probably not very confident about that letter at all. We really much prefer sequencing letters where we have a 1 in 1,000 or less chance of error. Even though FRED was designed for Sanger sequencing, we find that the manufacturers of massively parallel sequencers have re-implemented many aspects of FRED to represent the new, um, the new expectations of massively parallel sequencing. And so they still report the probability of error for each nucleotide by the FRED score for that nucleotide. Mapping is a process that aligns reads to an existing annotation. Assembly, on the other hand, is how we get long sequences from these short reads. Mapping speeds increase dramatically when something like a Burroughs-Wheeler transform index is available. And happily, there's lots of software out there to generate these BWTs for us from an annotation, making it very, very fast to say where is each of these um, where is each of these reads located, uh, uh, aligned within the genome? De novo assembly almost always today starts with a Kamer catalog that gets sorted, and then we seek a Wehlerian path that runs through that, those, uh, those Kamer catalogs in order to produce these reads. 
always taking into account those repetitive sequences and pseudogenes. So that was a lot of material to cover, but if you follow us this far, I think you're pretty well qualified to understand a lot of the, the literature that you're going to see in genome informatics.